Hey everybody, welcome to The Mana Leak. I'm John as always, and it's the final Eldritch Moon set review. Today we're going to cover all of the colorless cards, all of the multicolored cards, the artifacts, and the lands, and then maybe some slight little insights into what I think the pre-release and the format's going to be like. As always, you should go back and watch the previous video so you know the various disclaimers on this set review, but the major one is that this is a limited set review. I will be talking about draft and sealed, not standard or legacy or modern or commander or anything like that, just sealed and draft. But we're going to get on into the first colorless card. Up first, we have Abundant Maw. Abundant Maw is an 8 generic mana creature Eldrazi leech it on common. It's a 6-4. It has Emerge, 6 and a black, which we haven't fully talked about just yet. Emerge, the reminder text says, you may cast this spell by sacrificing a creature and paying the Emerge cost reduced by that creature's converted mana cost. I believe I mentioned in some other uh, set review this week, that doesn't decrease any of the colored mana. So even if you sacrifice 13 CMC Emrakul to Abundant Maw, you are still going to have to pay a black mana. You won't have to pay anything else, but you will have to play that black mana always. So generally, and I'm going to recommend you never, ever cast, or plan to cast anyways, any of these Emerge creatures for their regular cost. They're ridiculously overcosted. Even their Emerge cost seems a little bit high, but I came around on this by realizing that a lot of them cost 7, like Abundant Maw here does, and if you cast a 3-mana creature on turn 3, and then on turn 4 you play a land, you can cast Abundant Maw by tapping 4 lands and sacking a 3-drop, and then you've got your 7 mana. So I would generally treat these as 4 and 5 drops, at least the 7-mana ones. There's, there's one that's really expensive that I don't know about, but we'll talk about that in a second. But that's not all. It's a 6-4, and when you cast Abundant Maw, target opponent loses 3 life, and you gain 3 life. So it's Siege Rhino. Siege Rhino lives again. The other thing, of course, to keep in mind about Emerge creatures like this one is that they really should not ever be considered colorless creatures because, as I said, you should be ignoring the fact that they can be cast for eight colorless mana, or generic mana, rather. You should generally consider these to be the color of the Emerge cost. So this isn't a colorless creature. This is a, a black creature as far as deck building is concerned. Overall, this does seem pretty fine because, of course, as I said, if you can do that curve out, if you can play a three drop into this on turn four, it should be really solid. A 6-point life swing is serious business, and a 6-4 is pretty darn beefy. It's ever so slightly weak on the toughness, but in most cases I think this should be pretty solid. I'd be happy picking this relatively highly, but probably not first pick. I don't think it's quite there, but I think it is a relatively high pick and will be fantastic in many, many decks, as long as you can kind of hit that curve. So, B- minus for Abundant Maw. Next up, we have Decimator of the Provinces. Decimator of the Provinces is a 10 generic mana creature Eldrazi Boar at Mythic. It's a 7-7. Seven, seven. It has Emerge, 6 green, 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 so 9, so you get a 1 mana discount. When you cast Decimator of the Provinces, creatures you control get plus 2, plus 2, and gain Trample until end of turn. It has Trample. It also has Haste. This is the one that I really have no idea how it's going to play out. I'm initially worried because assuming that I'm not playing overcosted garbage, then the discount that I'm going to be getting on this is going to be relatively low. It's going to be three-ish mana, which means this is still going to be a six drop with green, green, green in the casting cost. You're going to need to be very, very solidly in green to cast this thing and probably preferably in some sort of ramp deck. Uh, if you can get this out, then it is basically the new crater hoof of sorts. You really do kind of have to have a sort of a wide board and that's not what ramp usually does. So I'm, I'm really kind of confused as to what this wants to be. And maybe it just wants to be a constructed card. Maybe it doesn't want to be a limited card. Cause I just, I don't feel like you can reliably get to this and have a wide board. Now it is a big beefy creature on its own. So I think that is totally fine. Uh, but I just don't think it's going to be quite as amazing as you know, we all know and love Craterhoof Behemoth to be, but that's because we know it in elf decks and things like that. Generally, I think uh, Big Eldrazi Pig here is going to be fine, and I think it could be first deckable and then totally and utterly build around it. But, you know, if I get this pack two pick one and I'm lightly in green, I don't know about taking it. It really comes down to how good Emerge is. It comes down to what decks exist in the format. I think this is really format dependent, but we will have to see just exactly where it ends up. I'm going to go with a B. I think you can very reliably first pick and build around it, but I, I just I don't know if the deck it really truly wants exists. So we'll start with a B. It could go up. It could go down. We'll have to see. 
Next up, we have Distended Mindbender. Distended Mindbender is 8 generic mana for a creature Eldrazi Insect at rare. It's a 5-5. It has a merge 5 black black. So it's a black creature, and it's got 7, just like the other one we talked about. It says, when you cast Distended Mindbender, target opponent reveals his or her hand. You choose from it a non-land card with CMC 3 or less, and a card with CMC 4 or greater. That player discards those cards. Getting to hopefully force your opponent to discard two full cards, but that is really up to chance. If we're casting this on turn four, we probably have the best chance in the game to hit a three and a four because they won't have had a chance to cast either of those. The later in the game this gets, the less likely you are to hit a three or less uh, card. Uh, you might still hit a four or less, but we'll see. I think you really do want to curve out with this. You want to make it an early play. And if it is an early play, then it's huge because not only get to, do you get to do that, you get a 5-5 five five out of it as well. So I think this is a really, really solid card, but I think it does fall off a fair bit in the late game. It is still a 5-5, five five, which is totally fine. You know, it's not the worst thing to ever happen, but the ability is going to get a lot less good. Still, I think it's a very solid pick. Uh, could be a first pick. It depends on the removal in the pack. Uh, but I'm going to go with a solid B for Distended Mindbender. Next up, we have Drownyard Behemoth. Drownyard Behemoth is 9 generic mana for a creature Eldrazi Crab at Uncommon. It's a 5-7. It has Flash. It, of course, has Emerge, 7 and a blue. And it says Drownyard Behemoth has Hexproof as long as it entered the battlefield this turn. So this Flash Crab is going to be a huge surprise. It's a, a slight pain that it comes down as an 8-drop instead of the 7-drop, like a lot of the Emerge creatures do, which means it is going to take an extra turn before you can uh, kind of awkwardly curve into it. The 7 mana is the pure curve in. The 3-drop, turn it into a 4-drop. Anything above or below that gets slightly awkward. You don't fully use every resource you have available to you. But still, sack a 3-drop, uh, pay 5, and you're good to go. With the Hexproof for a turn, this thing's basically going to be indestructible the turn it comes down, and it should basically function as removal in combat. You sack the creature, you block, and it's going to kill almost everything in the format. It cannot be responded to with a kill spell or anything like that. Seems really solid, decently high pick as well. It's going to be very, very, very good in the blue-green Emerge deck, and I'm excited to give that deck a try. I don't know if it's going to be good, but I'm excited to give it a try. I'm going to go with a B- minus on it just because it's that one mana extra making it slightly more awkward, but I think it is still a very solid pick. B- minus Drownyard Behemoth. Up next, we have Elder Deep Fiend. Elder Deep Fiend is an 8 generic mana creature, Eldrazi Octopus. It's at rare. It's a 5-6. It has Flash. Emerge, 5 blue-blue. So there's that magic 7 number. When you cast Elder Deep Fiend, tap up to 4 target permanents. I'm going to have to repeat this a little bit more. Obviously, with Emerge, you, you want to be curving properly. You want to really, especially if it's 7, have 3 drops that you're pretty happy sacking. And there are a decent number of creatures that do give you a benefit for sacking them at 3. So be on the lookout for that. But it's really going to take into account how good Emerge is. I think it is going to be decent, but I think you're going to have to keep an eye on your deck construction. As usual, I don't think you should ever be casting this for its full mana cost. If you are, something's probably gone wrong somewhere. Now, this is a solid creature. Uh, having it at 5-6 and flash means that we're hopefully going to maybe kill some things by surprise. The top four, down four creatures can just simply end the game if you're attacking in with your things. I think this is likely first pickable if Blue Tempo gets a little bit better in Eldritch Moon than it was in Shadows. Um, yeah, I, I rather like Elder Deep Fiend. I'd be pretty decently happy first picking it. Going to go with a B plus. I don't think it's exactly, you know, amazing super A status, but it's pretty darn close. So B plus for Elder Deep Fiend. Up next, here she is, Emrakul, the promised end. Emrakul, this time around, is a 13 generic mana, legendary creature Eldrazi at Mythic. It's a 13-13. Emrakul, the promised end, costs one generic less to cast for each card type among cards in your graveyard. When you cast Emrakul, you gain control of target opponent during that player's next turn. After that turn, that player takes an extra turn. Has flying, has trample, and has protection from instants. So let's be real, just like Ulamog and Kozilek, you're likely to never not first pick this, because hey, it's awesome, and probably going to be worth some amount of money. But just like them, it's also asking you a little bit much to think you're actually going to get to play this reliably and limited. Even the most dedicated of Delirium decks typically max out at like five card types in the graveyard, meaning this is still going to be an eight drop, which is still asking a lot in most decks. 
if you can ramp into it, and there are some decent ramp cards, we have that common mana dork, which is pretty solid, then it could be a serious threat. 1313 Flampo with protection from in instance is solid. Taking your opponent's turn means that you can empty their hands of their sorcery speed removal and etc. and maybe do some really, really bad blocks and whatnot. Everybody, when they first saw this, was really upset about the fact that the player gets to take another turn after it. But you, you at that point, should have really significantly ruined anything they can do, and you have a 13-13 on your side of the board. I don't really think it's any big deal whatsoever that your opponent gets to take an extra turn. Uh, if you play this, you should be pretty solidly in the uh, the driver's seat. So, I mean, it's Emrakul. You're going to first pick her every single time you see her, but it's often not going to be correct to play her. But go green ramp, and you very likely could. So, I mean, in your average deck, it's probably unplayable. But if you have the if you have the ramp, if you have the ways to get into it, I think this is a solid A minus. So, Emrakul, the promised end, A minus. Please build properly. Don't just jam it in any deck. Next up, we have Eternal Scourge. Eternal Scourge is three generic mana for a creature Eldrazi Horror at rare. It's a 3-3. Three, three. You may cast Eternal Scourge from Exile. When Eternal Scourge becomes the target of a spell or ability an opponent controls, Exile Eternal Scourge. And Eternal Scourge is a 3-3. Three, three. I don't recall if I said that or not. Anyways, Eternal Scourge. 3-3 three, three for 3 is totally fine and playable. Fits into every deck, so woo. It's not an emerge card, so it's, it's every deck can play this. It also creates some really interesting choices for your opponent. Removal suddenly becomes terrible because it's just going to come back the next turn. Any repeatable abilities are amazing. You know, if your opponent has a tapper, this thing is just never going to live for the low, low cost of probably one mana if they're using a uh, Sigardian Priest. I think ultimately this isn't first pickable unless the pack's pretty bad. But it's definitely likely kind of second to fifth picks, especially because it does fit in every single deck there is. So I'm going to go with a B minus on Eternal Scourge. Uh, I love the versatility, but you do open yourself up for some problems if your opponent has those cheap, easy, or even free uh, targeted abilities. Next up is It of the Horrid Swarm. It of the Horrid Swarm is an 8 generic mana creature Eldrazi Insect at common. It's a 4-4. It has Emerge, 6, and a green. And when you cast It of the Horrid Swarm, put two 1-1 one, one green insect creature tokens onto the battlefield. Again, this is a 7-drop Emerge creature, so as long as you curve your deck properly, it should function as a 4 or 5-drop. 4 or 5-drop, four, 4 4 with two 1-1s, one, quite solid. Though probably the weakest of all the Emerge creatures we've seen and, and will see in this set. Likely more of a mid to late pack pickup simply because not everyone's going to want it for their deck. Still, if you're in or headed towards the blue green emerge deck, this should be there for you and you should be relatively happy picking it up. Uh, I'm going to go with a C plus on it. It's not for everybody, but if you're in a, a, that one specific deck, I think it gets a bit better. Still really solid, just uh, kind of pales in comparison to the other ones. Up next, we have Lashweed Lurker. Lashweed Lurker is an eight generic mana creature Eldrazi horror at uncommon. It's a five four. It emerges for five green blue, and when you cast Lashweed Lurker, you may put target non-land permanent on top of its owner's library. So, Lashweed Lurker, this is the only two-color emerge card, and that definitely hurts it a little bit, because you are not going to play this in green or in blue. You're going to play it in green and blue. Uh, this has basically one home unless you splash for it, and I don't know if you'd want to splash for it, really. Uh, no other deck will be touching this, so odds are you should be able to get it to wheel in pack two. It's an okay size threat as well, with a very, very good ability. I love the ability. Uh, but that cost is going to hold it back just a little bit. I think it's still solid, and I think if you're in those colors, you are you are playing this, and you're being pretty happy about it. But I just don't think it results in being a high-ish pick. So I am going to go with a B- minus on it. I think you can leave this and get it back around generally. So, Lashweed Lurker, B-. minus. Next up, we have Mockery of Nature. Mockery of Nature is a 9 generic mana creature Eldrazi beast. It's an uncommon. It's a 6-5. It has emerge seven and a green, so it's an eight mana emerge. When you cast Mockery of Nature, you may destroy target artifact or enchantment. Meh. This is a vanilla six five for emerge eight in most costs in most cases, and that's just pretty darn boring. It's big, but it just has no evasion or anything on it. Probably not worth it in most cases, and a pretty low pick. Ultimately filler at best. You know, it, you're not going to destroy many artifacts or enchantments with this, though. So I just don't see it being a high pick. I've got it at a C. I think maybe out of the sideboard, it's okay in the blue-green uh, emerge deck, but generally I'm pretty out on it, so see. 
Next up, we have Vexing Scuttler. Vexing Scuttler is an 8 generic mana creature Eldrazi Crab at Uncommon. It's a 4-5. It's a it has Emerge 6 and a blue. And when you cast Vexing Scuttler, you may return target instant or sorcery from your graveyard to your hand. This is another fine Emerge 7 creature. I, I figure with that ability, it kind of wants to be in the spells deck. But I don't think the spell deck wants it. Because the spells deck isn't going to have many creatures. The one that it has are going to be relatively important, like Thermo Alchemist and uh, Weaver of Lightning, Docent of Perfection, etc. So you're not going to be sacking them. And they're not really going to want a dumb 4-5 creature just to get one thing back. So I don't think it really works in the blue-red spells deck. I think it works better in the tempo-y, mid-rangey creature deck that is packing a decent amount of removal and tempo spells to get them back. Still, it seems ultimately fine and playable, just not a super high pick. So I'm going to go with a C-plus on it. I think it's fine in those decks. Don't fool yourself. I don't think this goes in the spells deck, despite the rules text down there. So, Vexing Scuttler, C-plus. The final colorless card is Wretched Griff. Wretched Griff is 7 generic mana for a creature Eldrazi Hippogriff. It's at common. It's a 3-4. It has Emerge 5 and a blue. This is a 6-drop Emerge creature. It says, when you cast Wretched Griff, draw a card. Awesome. And it says, flying. Also really awesome. So this is a six drop emerge flyer, which is pretty aggressively costed. Unfortunately, it does have the same curve as a seven drop emerge. You could sack a two drop and then play your fourth land and cast it. But yeah, that's not really that big of a deal. You're still getting this on turn four generally uh, at the earliest, just like the other ones. Still, it's a three four flyer and it draws you a card. That is fantastic. It's going to be a really decent game that you're going to have once this comes down, especially if it comes down early. And even if it comes down later, it still is going to be a very solid creature, and that card draw is fantastic. Seems like a solid high mid-pack pickup, and I think most blue decks that want creatures are going to want this. I think it's a solid B. I think you should take this probably like pick the pick three-ish, maybe pick four-ish, through to like pick six or so. Any later than that, and you probably should consider it to be a signal. Uh, solid B. I really, really, really like Wretched Griff. Uh, yeah, solid B. So that's going to wrap it up for Colorless. They're all rather interesting, and outside of Emrakul and Eternal Scourge, they're all not really colorless. They're generally blue or green or black. So make sure that you do keep that in mind. Just because they have that colorless cost up there, you should not be putting them in any deck other than what their emerge cost is. But we're going to jump on over to the multicolored cards now, starting with Blood Hall Priest. Blood Hall Priest is two black red for a creature vampire cleric at rare. She's a 4-4, four four, and whenever Blood Hall Priest enters the battlefield or attacks, if you have no cards in hand, Blood Hall Priest deals two damage to target creature or player, and you can madness her in for one black red. 4-4-4-4 four, 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 four is totally fine, even better if you can madness her out a turn early with you know, a surprise blocker, it could be fantastic. The ability is nice and exactly what an aggressive barf your hand onto the battlefield type deck would love to have. Uh, this hits virtually as a 6-4, and that just seems all around solid if you do have, you know, the empty hand. This probably is first pickable despite the two colors and should be a super strong creature. It does probably want to be your curve topper though because you really need to be emptying your hand reliably for this to be, you know, truly amazing. I'm willing to go B plus on it. I think you do want to uh, take it and build around it. If you're in just kind of a basic mid-rangey black red, it's not going to be nearly as good. It's still going to be 100% playable as a 4 4 4 4 and, you know, maybe an upside here or there. But you really want to barf your hand out fast for this to be really, really good. Up next, we have Campaign of Vengeance. Campaign of Vengeance is three white-black for an enchantment at Uncommon. Whenever a creature you control attacks, defending player loses one life and you gain one life. Big, gigantic, eh. It's a five-mana enchantment that wants you to be in a position to attack freely. How about I just play a five-drop creature that I can attack with freely. This obviously gets better if you have a lot of spirits or something, but again, it's just not impactful enough for me. We've seen this type of enchantment before. We've seen spells similar to this before. Foul Tongue Shriek or Foul Tongue Invocation was a similar spell before. These, these just catch everybody. Everybody always thinks these are amazing and they never, ever, ever, ever are. Yeah, you'll lose to it here or there where somebody, you know, gets the seven spirits down that normally you would have zero problem with, but you don't quite deal with at that time. But it's just so unlikely for this to really be good that I'm just out on this card. 
Solid D, I never want to play this. I think this ability is just going to be just as bad as it always is, especially at 5 mana. Next up, we have Gisa and Giralf. Gisa and Giralf are two blue-black for legendary creature human wizard at Mythic. They're a 4-4, and when Gisa and Giralf enters the battlefield, put the top four cards of your library into your graveyard. During each of your turns, you may cast a zombie creature card from your graveyard. Again, it's a 4-mana four 4-4, four, four, which is totally playable, just like Bloodhall Priest. This one does require some work to be much better, uh, which Blood Hall Priest requires as well. You do need to really have a critical mass of zombies, and I ideally good ones, to ensure that you're getting a lot of value out of this. It, it should create a very flavorful game where you can throw your zombies in front of things and then bring them back next turn. Definitely a build around first pick where you take this and you push zombies really hard. Getting this pack two might make that plan a bit harder, especially given the lack of quality zombies you're going to get in pack three three in shadows there's just so few there should be interesting but it does require a fairly specific deck I, I think it's first pickable only because that's where you really want to take it for it to be great where you can super build around it uh, if you're building the zombie deck hoping to get this you're asking way too much still i'm gonna go b plus it's 100 playable as a 4 4 4 4 that does some mill which blue black is generally going to be okay with even if it's not the super zombie deck but it's obviously going to get better if you are so geese and draw b plus Next up, we have Grim Flayer. Grim Flayer is black green for a creature human warrior at Mythic. It's a 2 2, it has trample. Whenever Grim Flayer deals combat damage to a player, look at the top three cards of your library. Put any number of them into your graveyard and the rest back on top of your library in any order. Delirium. Grim Flayer gets plus two plus two as long as there are four or more card types among cards in your graveyard. Grim Flayer is okay, but I think he's really meant more for constructed. I, I wasn't super interested in the uh, the contingency plan effect of contingency plan or Tygum scheming as it's known. I'm not really interested in that effect on Grim Flayer either. Like, yeah, it enables Delirium maybe, which helps him get a little bit bigger, but it's just not that good of an effect. It, it's all right-ish, but Eh. So really, this is a 2-2 trample for 2, which is fine. It's playable, although it's two colors, so it's more difficult to cast than a grizzly, grizzly bear should be. If you can get Delirium, which hopefully you can rapidly with this guy if you're getting damage through, but you have to be getting damage through, which is another big problem, then it becomes a 4-4 trample. So, good job. But this is never going to be a 4-4 trample on turn 2. Ever. So, I just, I don't think this guy's very good. I'm, I'm pretty sure he's really good in Constructed. I think he's actually worth a fair bit of money right now on pre-orders, but in Limited, I just don't think it's very good. I don't think it's first pickable in any way, shape, or form. I think if you're in these colors, why not? But I don't think it's a reason to go into those colors, and I don't think it's first pickable. Maybe I'm missing something here, but I just don't see this being amazing in Limited, so uh, I've got to go with a C plus on it. I, I think if you're in the colors, you'll play it, but you won't be going out of your way. But, of course, if it's worth as much as I think it is, and I think it was pre-ordering for at least $12 or something like that last I saw, then you are going to first pick it, of course, at something like an f and So, Grim Flare, I'm going with a C+. Next up is Heron's Grace Champion. Heron's Grace Champion is two green-white for a creature human knight at rare. It's a 3-3. It has flash, it has lifelink, and when Heron's Grace Champion enters the battlefield, other humans you control get plus one, plus one, and gain lifelink until end of turn. This seems pretty darn solid to me, like really solid. It's a 3-3 flash lifelinker for four, which is instantly playable right then and there. Getting part of a tenacity for free for all of your humans in the most blatantly human colors is fantastic. This card seems very first pickable despite the, the uh, double colors. And if you're in these colors, uh, this should be one of the cards that you're hoping to see in pack two. It's not quite bomb status, but it will change the course of the game immediately. Very excited to play with this. Uh, I've got to go with a A- minus on it. I, th I think it's very, very solid. Next up, we have Mercurial Geists. Mercurial Geists is a two blue red creature spirit on common. It's a one three. It has flying, and whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, Mercurial Geists gets plus three plus O oh, until end of turn. This is a, uh, a slightly beefier Wee Dragonauts. 
So we Dragonauts was basically this card minus a bunch of things. It got plus two plus oh, it only cost three mana. I think they were one twos, maybe they were even one ones. Um, this is just a slightly bigger version, and I think this is another great addition to the blue red spells matters deck. And again, it's not sitting at rare, and it is at a at uncommon, but you are going to be the only person who wants this card. Um, the four mana does hurt this a little bit, but the fact that these can become four threes, or maybe if you're lucky, seven threes, it really shouldn't matter. Um, now, of course, outside of that deck, you know, outside of blue red spells, you don't want these at all. It's like maybe a sideboard blocker against a heavy flyer deck, maybe, but. If you're blue red spells, this is a card that you're really hoping to see. And if you want to force the uh, the uh, deck archetype, you could maybe even first pick one of these. I probably will at some point because I really want to try that deck. So material geists, I think, are pretty darn good in the uh, uh, the blue red spells deck. I'm going to give them a B minus there. Outside of that deck, they're like a D plus at best. Up next, we have Morn Willow. Morn Willow is one black green for a creature plant skeleton at uncommon. It's a 3 2. It has haste. It has delirium. When Morn Willow enters the battlefield, if there are four or more card types among cards in your graveyard, creatures with power two or less can't block this turn. It's kind of like a weaker drag mangler because it doesn't have scavenge, which was a card that was basically this uh, minus delirium plus the fact that you could take it out of your graveyard to put counters on something, which was really good. This is much less good. Uh, honestly, you're unlikely to have Delirium when you ideally want this card to come down on turn three, since it's a 3-2 haste, because later in the game, it's not going to be very good. And yeah, your opponent's little creatures won't be able to block, but it's later in the game. They're probably going to have big creatures. It's not bad. It's just, you know, it's it's not terrible, but it's also not great. Honestly, if the Delirium effect was three or less, I'd be way more in on this. But really, I don't think this is much more than just filler. I'll give it a C plus, but nothing more than that. Up next, we have a reprint. We have Ride Down from, I believe, Cons of Tarkir, or one of that block at least. Ride Down is red-white for an instant at Uncommon. It says, destroy target blocking creature. Creatures that were blocked by that creature this combat game trample until end of turn. And just for anybody who's not familiar with the rules too too much if a creature with trample is blocked and the blocking creature disappears for some reason they trample all that damage over to the face so that's why this card's really good uh yeah ride down is pretty solid removal if you're in red white being instant speed is fantastic which it, it would have to be there's no blocking creatures in the main phase and being able to make your creatures trample over their entire damage is just super solid uh if your opponent's attacking and has red white open be very careful with your chump blocks because you might just be dead not a super high pick because of the color restriction, but it is still very solid. And once you know you're going to be in those colors, or even if you're going to be in one, this could push you into the other. Uh, you're going to take this B minus. I really like Ride Down. I'm glad to see it back. Up next is Spell Queller. Spell Queller is one white blue for a creature spirit at rare. It's a two three. It has flash. It has flying. When Spell Queller enters the battlefield, exile target spell with converted mana cost four or less. When Spell Queller leaves the battlefield, the exile card's owner may cast that card without paying its mana cost. 2-3 Flash Flyer for three. I'm sold. Get in my deck. The fact that you get to temporarily counter the spell is great. I feel like it's likely better to hit a pump spell or similar, tr similar trick than a removal spell, letting your opponent get a removal spell back, likely when they want. Unless, of course, you're the one sacking your spell queller, but generally they're going to be the ones killing it, so they know when it's going to die. That seems a little bit dangerous to leave a, a, a kill spell sitting off in the ether, ready to kill something even better later in the game. Hitting a pump spell, I think, is a little bit better, because at least then they're getting some lesser value out of it. As well, hitting a small creature, if they, you know, if they use up removal on Spell Queller later in the game and they get back a 2-2, not really a big deal. So I think you do kind of want to hit those small middling creatures with it, the pump spells with it. I think hitting a removal spell with it is definitely very dangerous to do. It's going to be very interesting to see how this plays out. I definitely think it is uh, kind of on the edge of first pickable, as usual with most multicolored cards, with the multicolored aspect being what's really holding it back. I think it's a B plus. I think it's relatively high pick once you have an inkling that you're heading into that direction and obviously a very high pick in pack two if you're blue white. I think it's a pretty solid card. B plus. Definitely interested to play with it. We're almost done the review, so I guess it's time to talk about Planeswalker number two. Tamio Field Researcher. Tamio Field Researcher is a one green, white, blue 
Planeswalker Tamio at Mythic. She starts with four loyalty counters. Her plus one is choose up to two target creatures. Until your next turn, whenever either of those creatures deals combat damage, you draw a card. Her minus two says tap up to two target non-land permanent. They don't untap during their controller's next untap step. Her minus seven is draw three cards. You get an emblem with, quote, you may cast non-land cards from your hand without paying their mana costs. End quote. Uh, let's get this out of the way right away. Three color planeswalkers are really hard to do in limited outside of a wedge or shard set. Sarkon was cool, but he was even in a sort of wedge-ish, wedge-ish set. Although by the time we got around to that, it was more a two color format and he was pretty darn hard to cast. I think Tamio likely will be similar. Of course, outside of a high level GP or something though, Let's be real, you're first picking her and trying it anyways. I think obviously you're going to want to be green. You're going to want to be green blue or green white and splash the other color because green is what's going to have the most access to other colors of mana and ways to make them or ways to fetch them and things like that. I don't think you probably want to be a full three color deck. Three colors are iffy in a lot of formats and a lot of people try them way too regularly. So I wouldn't advise going full on band. I'd recommend green white or green blue and then splash anyway so her abilities she starts with four loyalty counters for four mana that's fantastic she passes the planeswalker vanilla test her plus one is some serious card draw note that this is really an incredible version of the ophidian effect as it's purely combat damage not combat damage to a player combat damage to a creature combat damage to a player combat damage to a planeswalker combat damage lets you draw a card in addition you can hit your opponent's creatures with this it might convince your opponent not to attack if it means that you're going to get some cards if they do. So her plus one is somewhat uncharacteristically sort of protection. It's not the best protection because it doesn't actually stop your opponent, you know, physically or, or via game rules. It just maybe convinces them to uh, to not attack Tamio. Um, and it also functions as card draw. So it's like card draw and protection in her plus one. Her minus two is equally awesome. It's pure protection. Freezing up the two opponent's uh, creatures protects her very, very well. It helps you aggro through. It just has so many uses. Her ultimate is just literally win the game. Or, or more specifically, it's ancestral recall and then win the game. Uh, if you ultimate with this, you need to really screw up to lose. She has to survive three full turns without being hit to get there, but boy, when you get there, it's going to be one of the most demoralizing things ever for your opponent. Uh, I think her ultimate is definitely one that you can very strongly aim for. It's not one of those ultimates where it's like, well, it'll put me in a really good spot to begin to win. No, she should basically let you just barf your hand out and win the game from there. Uh, Tamio seems fantastic. Realistically, as I said, outside of a, you know, top eight GP, you're first picking this every single time you see it. A little bit less realistically, you're maybe passing it over premium removal or anything like that, but I think you are still picking it and just going for it because, Oh, she is just solid. She's fantastic. She is a solid A in my books. Um, I think she's fantastic. I just don't think you should push that three color deck. Do a two color with a splash. That's going to be the safest way to go about it. So Tamio, A. Our final multicolored card is Ulrich of the Kralen Horde. Ulrich is three red green for a legendary creature human werewolf at Mythic. He's a 4-4. Four, four. Whenever this creature enters the battlefield or transforms into Ulrich of the Kralen Horde, target creature gets plus four plus four until end of turn. And he has the old werewolf ability where if nobody casts a spell last turn, you transform him at the beginning of each upkeep. His transformed side is Ulrich Uncontested Alpha. He's a legendary creature werewolf at Mythic. He's a 6-6. Six, six. Whenever this creature transforms into Ulrich Uncontested Alpha, you may have it fight target non-werewolf creature you don't control. At the beginning of each upkeep, if a player cast two or more spells last turn, transform him back, just like normal werewolves from Shadows and from original Innistrad. Uh, Ulrich looks really, really, really solid. I know a lot of people were really unhappy with him as far as EDH and whatnot goes, but in Limited, he's just really good. He's a slightly overcosted 4-4 at 5 mana. 
considering we've seen a number of multicolored 4 for 4s for 4 already, but he makes, you know, one of your creatures gigantic for the turn, and when he transforms, he very likely gets to kill whatever you want on the other side of the battlefield. If you can flip this back and forth a bit, you should get insane value out of it, but that's not even really needed. The first flip and then a 6-6 six, six should probably be a pretty big nail in the coffin. Seems like a very solid limited creature. As I said, I know EDH players... This isn't the incredibly insane legendary werewolf you wanted, but it's still really good. Uh, it'll remain to see, be seen if the red-green werewolf deck stays relevant in this new format. I think it will, but I think it will take the format of more of a rampy, stompy deck rather than the uh, slightly almost aggro deck that red-green werewolves was in Shadows of Innistrad. But I really like Ulrich. I'm giving him a solid A. All right, we're going to move on to the artifact cards now. Up first, we have Cathar Shield. Cathar Shield is a zero mana artifact equipment in common. Equipped creature gets plus th zero plus three and has vigilance. Equip cost of three. Let's get this out of the way right now. It is not a free card. It costs zero mana, but it costs a spot in your deck. It's a card that you're going to draw instead of a card that does anything worthwhile. This is not a free card. Don't treat it as that. Plus zero, plus three, and vigilance for a three equip cost is in no way worth it. This is just another piece of terrible, terrible, terrible equipment that's going to convince uh, some newer players that, hey, maybe it's good and maybe it's actually free. It's really not. Please don't ever play this. It is a bad, bad, bad card. D minus. Up next, we have the last double face card, Cryptolith Fragment. Cryptolith Fragment is three generic mana for an artifact in uncommon. Cryptolith Fragment enters the battlefield tapped. Tap, add one mana of any color to your mana pool. Each player loses one life. At the beginning of your upkeep, if each player has ten or less life, transform Cryptolith Fragment. It turns into Aurora of Emrakul. Aurora of Emrakul is a creature Eldrazi Reflection. Didn't know Reflection was a creature type. This might be the first one. It's a 1-4. It has Flying. It has Death Touch. And whenever Aurora of Emrakul attacks, each opponent loses 3 life. I'm definitely unsure of this one. I don't think I like it, but I'm also ready to be wrong. It's a 3-mana mana rock that enters tapped. That's not great. It taps for any color, which is great. The life loss is symmetrical, which shouldn't really matter unless you're being heavily aggroed out. The flip side is where it gets really interesting. But I just don't know if I want my game plan to reliably be controlling both mine and my opponent's life totals and having them be at 10 or less. That just sounds really dangerous. If you pull it off, you get to hit your opponent hopefully for 3, if not 4 damage a turn, putting your opponent on a very short clock, a 3 turn clock right there. But remember, you're now at a less than ideal position as well, where you need to have blockers back as well. This just feels a little bit too mutually assured destruction-y for me to want to try it, but I'm going to keep an eye on it for sure. It could be okay, but I'm going to start cautiously at a C-, minus. but I'm going to keep a very close eye on it because it could very much well be a C+, plus, a B-, minus. who knows, but I'm going to start with a C-. minus. Up next, we have Cultist Staff. Cultist Staff is two generic mana for an artifact equipment in common. Equipped creature gets plus two, plus two. Equip cost of three. Again, this is just not good equipment. Paying five mana to give a creature plus two, plus two is just not good. Yes, if that creature dies, which you probably shouldn't be hoping for and rooting to happen, then the next one only costs three, but that's just so much mana for such a low, low, low impact effect. Absolutely not. Cultist Staff, just further bad equipment. Total D minus. I'm never touching it. Up next is Field Creeper. Field Creeper is two generic mana for an artifact creature Scarecrow. It's a 2-1, and that's it. It's got really cool art. I do really like this art by Anthony Palumbo, uh, but no rules text. It's a vanilla 2-1 for two, so it's a, a piker, a goblin piker. Uh, playable if you're being super aggressive. If you're not, probably not what you want to have. It dies to one drops. It's, it, it's, it's not the best. Generally, you're going to cut these pretty reliably. So C- minus for Field Creeper. It's a slight desperation play unless you're massively aggressive with your uh, with your deck. Up next is Geist Fueled Scarecrow. Geist Fueled Scare Scarecrow is a four generic mana artifact creature scarecrow on common. It's a four four, so it's a four four for four. 
It's got a downside. Creature spells you cast cost one more to cast. It's not even symmetrical, so your opponent isn't affected by this in any way, shape, or form. It's a pure 4-4 for 4 with a downside. I don't like the downside. I figure the only place this downside would be okay would be the mostly spells deck, and the mostly spells deck does not want a generic 4-4 for 4, 4, 4. So I don't think this is a good card either. I think this is a total D... Let's go with a D plus. I guess you could play it if you really, really, really desperately wanted a creature and then wasn't going to play creatures for a little while, but it's just so low impact. I just don't see it being playable. So D plus, maybe too generous. Up next is Lupine Prototype. Lupine Prototype is a two generic mana artifact creature wolf construct. It's a rare, it's a five, five. And it says Lupine Prototype can't attack or block unless a player has no cards in hand. No? No. This card is dead way too often. I just don't believe you can reliably build a Hellbent deck in this format to make this good. And if you do, I, I just feel like you've built such a low-curve, mediocre deck that if your opponent deals with this in any way, like, if it's a low-curve deck because it's a really good low-curve deck, awesome, great. This maybe could be okay but if this is your plan and your opponent just kills it then you've built a crummy deck i'm not going to be the one to give this wolf a try i do not like it i think it is absolute garbage absolute f i think this should be like last pick absolutely out on lupine prototype f up next is Slayer's Cleaver. Slayer's Cleaver is three generic mana for an artifact equipment and uncommon. Equipped creature gets plus three, plus one, and must be blocked by an Eldrazi if able. Equip cost of four. Plus three, plus one. We're talking now, but seven mana for that. No, 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 no. This is, again, bad equipment. Seven mana for plus three, plus one, and must be blocked by an Eldrazi if able. Just no. So ridiculously expensive. I'm out on this one as well. I'll give it a D plus just because it is a lot of power, but I'm still not touching this. D plus. Up next is Soul Separator. Soul Separator is three generic mana for an artifact at rare. Pay five, tap it, and sacrifice it. Exile target creature card from your graveyard. Put a token onto the battlefield that's a copy of that card, except it's a 1 1. It's a spirit, in addition to its other types and it has flying. Put a black zombie creature token onto the battlefield with power equal to that card's power and toughness equal to that card's toughness. This is a really cool card. It's a really cool, flavorful kind of mechanic they've built here. You're separating the soul from this zombie. So the soul is the creature. It's an exact copy, except it's really, really, really weak and flies. And then the zombie is just as strong as the body was, but it doesn't remember how to do anything that the creature previously was able to it's just a a, a a rules text barren zombie that being said i don't think this card's good i think it's fun eight mana to get a one one hopefully with a cool ability and an xx equal to toughness is uh power and toughness is one heck of a big cost and not one that i'm going to fool around with especially because this card is miserable unless you've already played and lost a great target in addition, it being only a single use makes me want to just avoid it as well. I'd be excited to see this played on something like Community Super League as like a build around me card. But realistically, I just don't think this is playable. Absolute F as well. Up next, we have Stitcher's Graft. Stitcher's Graft is one generic mana for an artifact equipment at rare. It says equipped creature gets plus three plus three. Equip cost of two. Sounds incredible. However, whenever equipped creature attacks, it doesn't untap during its controller's next untap step. Well, then I'll just transfer it over to another creature, right? Well, whenever Stitcher's Graft becomes unattached from a permanent, sacrifice that permanent. It's a super, super cheap equipment, but that freeze downside, that sacrifice downside, if you want to move it, just, ugh. If you can churn out a bunch of spirits, I could see this being decent-ish, where you equip it on a new spirit each turn, and you don't care that they're dying because you're somehow producing a bunch of them. As well, it's okay if you can put this on a Vigilance creature, but don't waste your time, you know, thinking about how to get a creature and then thinking of another card to put Vigilance on it and then this card to put this on it because you're just putting way too many cards into one single creature. This isn't Theros. Uh, yeah. 
Also, to head off any rules questions, you can't equip this to opponent's creatures. It's not removal. I know that will be a judge question in the pre-release. Uh, ultimately, I don't think this is an F exactly, but it's not something that I'm going to play, I don't think. I I'm, I'm going to go with a D- minus on this one. I don't think it's good. I'm willing to see if it plays out in a massively wide spirits deck, if that even exists. Up next is Terrarian. Terrarian's a reprint. It's a single mana for an artifact at common. Terrarian enters the battlefield tapped. Pay two, tap, sacrifice Terrarian. Add two mana in any combination of colors to your mana pool. When Terrarian is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, draw a card. This is a fine card. It's not something that every deck wants, but if you are splashing for something, this is a great way to ensure that you get those colors, plus you get to draw a card. Some other decks may want to play it just to smooth their mana and to get the card draw. It's a very 23rd card for those kinds of decks. It's not a high pick in any way, shape, or form. It should definitely go mid to late mid pack. But uh, yeah, it's a fine enough card. I'm willing to give it just a, a middle of the road C. The last artifact we have is Thirsting Axe. Thirsting Axe is three generic mana for an artifact equipment and uncommon. Equipped creature gets plus four, plus zero. Equip cost of two. Sounds amazing, right? Well, at the beginning of your end step, if equipped creature didn't deal combat damage to a creature this turn, sacrifice it. I first read this, and even as I watched the pre-pre-release, assumed that this said at the beginning of your end step, if equipped creature didn't deal damage, sacrifice it. But it's explicitly to a creature. That's so narrow and so easy for your opponent to say, well, I'll take the damage, and then your creature's dead. This card just also seems awful. The equipment in this set is miserably bad. I don't see anything even remotely close to a true faith sensor. Uh, this card just, again, maybe if you have this super wide spirits deck that I'm hypothetically thinking of that may not even exist, maybe it's okay. Maybe in a zombie deck that goes super wide, it's okay. But outside of that, I just don't see it. I'm going to go with a D- minus on this one as well. I, I just don't think it's good. And I think a lot of people are going to miss that word creature on this card. So be very careful, but D-. minus. All right, onto the lands. We've only got three of them. Up first is Gyre Reach Sanitarium. Gyre Reach Sanitarium is a legendary land at rare. Tap, add colorless to your mana pool. Pay two, tap. Each player draws a card then discards a card, so each player loots. This seems terrible. I I'm hurting my mana base in order to loot and pay for it three mana, two mana plus tapping this land, and giving my opponent a free loot. That sounds miserable. That sounds ridiculously miserable. Yeah, maybe you can mill your opponent if they're out of cards, but they know this land is there. They're not going to ever go out of cards if they don't have to. This just seems terrible. Just terrible. I'm never touching this card. Madness enabler, blah, blah, blah. No, the downside of this card is just massive. Absolute F for Gyre Reach Sanitarium. Up next is our last meld card, Handware Battlements. Handware Battlements is a land at rare. Tap, add colorless to your mana pool. Pay red and tap. Target creature gains haste until end of turn. Pay three red red tap. If you both own and control Handware Battlements and a creature named Handware Garrison, exile them, then meld them into Handware the Writhing Township. So let's just talk about the front face first off, which has really cool Emrakul art in the sky, as, as did Gyre Reach Sanitarium, actually. Um, so hurting your mana base in order to give things haste at the cost of a red mana plus another mana by tapping this land does never seem worth it to me. That just, that's not worth it. That's not a great choice of lands in your thing. This obviously goes up a billion times if you have actually managed to draft Hanware Garrison in addition to Hanware Battlement. But again, that's not super likely. Um, yes. People aren't going to draft this heavily, so if you have opened Garrison and somebody opens this, if the table isn't hate drafting, which you can never guarantee depending on where you are, uh, you may not get Handware Battlements. But realistically, the odds are just low that you're going to actually get a Handware Battlements plus a Handware Garrison. But if you do, let's take a look at what Handware Garrison and Handware Battlements uh, meld into. 
Hanweir the Writhing Township is a legendary creature Eldrazi ooze. It's a 7-4. It has trample and haste. And whenever Hanweir the Writhing Township attacks, put two 3-2 three, two colorless Eldrazi horror creature tokens onto the battlefield tapped and attacking. The Writhing Township is awesome. It's a huge creature that attacks virtually for 13 damage. If this survives through its first attack, the game should basically be done. If you can pull this off, you, you should be sitting pretty. But again, it's so unlikely that you'll be opening and past both of these cards to pull it off that it really shouldn't matter. For Handwear Battlements, I've got to give it a D. I just don't think it's a very good card, so... D unless you have Hanweir Garrison already. And I don't even think that I would ever draft Battlements first, hoping to open Garrison later, unless there was nothing else left in the pack. So we're talking like late pack. All right, we've made it. Card number 205, the last card in the set, Nephelia Academy. Nephelia Academy is a land at Uncommon. If a spell or ability an opponent controls causes you to discard a card, you may reveal that card and put it on top of your library instead of putting it anywhere else. Tap, add colorless to your mana pool. I guess this is like anti-thoughtseize tech for modern or something, but this just is not for limited. It's not for limited at all. These effects are so few and far between, and generally just should not be played by your opponent outside of amazing things like Distended uh, Mindbender or something like that. But, you know, your average Mind Rot spell, that's just not something that should really be played that you'll ever see. So, you know, this could live in the sideboard, I guess, but it really should be like last pick and really never played. I'll give it a D just in case you're up against Mindbender or something like that, but realistically you're never playing this card it's just bad all right that is gonna wrap it up for all of the review so i'm gonna do just some quick insight on the pre-release and what i expect now of course as i said i have not played with these cards so i don't necessarily know what to expect i did watch the pre-pre-release but the pre-pre-release is not the best of places to watch you're watching a bunch of people who are playing entertaining magic and talking and seeing the cards for the first time with zero prep so while you can get a little bit of insight from it it's not going to be the best insight uh mine's not going to be much better however just a few quick notes and uh, assumptions and insights that i have madness there is much 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 less of it i don't think the madness deck will be dead but I think it will hurt. It will not be quite as good as it was, or at least it will be different. Delirium is going to be much harder to pull off. We're only going to have one pack of Vessel of Nascencies, and Vessel of Nascencies were really one of the major fueling forces of the Delirium deck, so I think it will be much harder to pull off. The Clue deck is dead. The Clue deck is dead. Blue-green clues will not be draftable, because we're only getting one pack of Shadows of Innistrad. It will not be draftable. Blue-green is now Emerge. Speaking of Emerge, think about your curve and treat those Emerge creatures as where you're likely to cast them, not their printed CMC, because you really should never be casting them for their printed CMC. The red-blue spells deck seems to me to be much easier to pull off. I think it could actually be a decent thing uh, in draft. I, I would not recommend it in sealed. You're just not going to have all the cards you need for it. Uh, zombies are actually a thing this time around. We had a lot of zombie cards. Not a lot. We had a number of zombie cards in Shadows that seemed like they wanted a zombie deck and it just wasn't there. Turns out it was over here in Eldritch Moon. Uh, there's a sacrifice theme that I'm not exactly sure what colors the deck will be there's at least off the top of my head white cards black cards and green cards that all want this sacrifice deck to exist maybe it'll be an abzan deck but i'm not entirely sure but let me know your insights let me know your assumptions let me know what you're thinking about this set going into the pre-release this weekend in the comments down below as always if you have any questions comments or suggestions you can find me on twitter at the mana leak that's l-e-e-k like the vegetable not the card you can also find me at twitch.tv slash the mana leak and facebook.com slash the Mana Leak. You found me here on YouTube. You've got that comment section down below. Please make use of it. Click that thumbs up icon if you enjoy my content. Click that subscribe button if you want to make sure to see all the latest content as it gets uploaded. Uh, tomorrow will be the top 10 mythics and or rares that I want to open and play with in my pre-release pool. Uh, on the weekend, I will have a pre-release recap, including video and images from my pre-release. Next week, we'll be back to regularly scheduled tuning with Crack-A-Pack Tuesdays, Wacky Wednesdays, Top 10 Thursdays, and Spiky Saturdays. Next Spiky Saturday will be a behind-the-shoulder draft of Eldritch Moon. So if you want to see one of the first 
draft content videos up on YouTube, you should subscribe. But as always, if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions, let me know. Otherwise, I'll see you all tomorrow for Top 10 Thursday.